So let's go ahead and get started. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce our two presenters. We've got almost 30 years of uh, learning industry technology experience uh, before you today. So you're going to get a wealth of information. Um, first, Caleb Johnson, who is the Director of Strategic Accounts at Expertus, who is a uh, Expertus is a, a learning management system um, company who's been developing the Expertus One technology. He has over 10 years of experience in learning software marketing, the market, and working with Fortune 500 companies to develop and roll out complex learning solutions and complex mobile learning solutions, which are becoming more, less and less complex these days. Um, also uh, on is Jim Lundy. He is the founder, CEO, and lead analyst at Aragon Research. And if you've been in the industry for a while, you've probably heard his name and heard his comments and analysis of where the industry is going and things like that. He has an amazing wealth of learning industry experience, I believe, over 16 years in this industry. And a lot of that time spent, I believe, helping companies maximize their learning organizations. So, so happy to have these two on the webinar today and give you what I think is a great visionary view of what you can do with mobile learning. So, Jim, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started with you. Thank you very much, Gordon. Glad to be here. And as Gordon indicated, we're really here to talk about mobile and mobile learning and mobile first. And so, uh, again, I'm Jim Lundy. I'm the founder and CEO of Aragon Research. I'm going to be joined with, by Caleb Johnson. Uh, thanks to Gordon uh, for the great intros. So, again, today we're going to talk about um, something that has been talked about really uh, has been a dream in the learning industry for almost 10 years, which is mobile learning. But really, not just about mobile learning, but about how people can start to do learning uh, in kind of a new innovative way, which we're kind of referring to as mobile first. And uh, it's not just about, you know, looking at something on your tablet but or your phone, but it's about being able to do more. And, you know, if you leave this webinar with anything today, it's really about the idea of it should be a better experience. There should be more that you can do uh, with your learning experience. And, and again, we do think that, you know, when you look at both consumer and enterprise, you know, more people spend more time today on their mobile device than anything else. And so when you see that trend, again, which has been going on for several years, the question is, why can't we do more when it comes to uh, the, the, the learning space? And you know, what we see is we see uh, our business leaders, we don't call them users, we call them business leaders uh, and innovators. Uh, people are doing that, uh, but in some cases they're doing it um, you know, without thinking about it. And, but the question is, when it comes to really you know, the innovative ways of learning, how can we make, as an industry, the shift to do more uh, with uh, a mobile first approach, which again, we'll talk about in the course of this webinar. What I want to talk to you about today are really four uh, issues, some key trends that are you know, affecting learning uh, relative to mobility, uh, some ones that you may already say, yeah, got that one, but maybe some ones that you haven't thought about. Talk about some of the technology that are going to enable this shift. And so clearly we're going to be talking about learning, but in the context of mobile today, because at Aragon we do cover learning and talent management, but we also cover mobile itself holistically and, you know, in, in its own right. So when we have developed things like mobile apps, so we actually have experience in submitting apps to app stores. Um, we're going to take a, a little break, and Caleb's going to be uh, talking about what Expertus is doing. But we're going to also talk about one of the toughest challenges in the industry, which is legacy content. In fact, we think one of the things that's happened, and again, uh, having dealt with content in general for many years, um, is that sometimes content holds back the organization. And uh, so we're going to talk about that whole issue. How do you deal with it, you know, this fact that sometimes we can't mobilize that content? And then kind of wrap up with some ideas around some best practices. So that's our agenda. We're excited to be here. Uh, and again, we are doing a Twitter chat. So while I'm talking, I'm probably not going to be tweeting, but uh, we've got uh, lots of people out there 
uh, participating through Twitter chat, and the hashtag is uh, hashtag mobile LRN. So mobile LRN is the hashtag, and uh, you know I'm actually sitting here with one of our Aragon interns, and he's tweeting it, and uh, we're having a lot of fun. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. So really, some of the key trends that we're seeing relative to uh, things that are affecting uh, business, that all of these things are going to be driving, uh, in many cases, how people learn. And again, cloud is not a new uh, terminology or even practice in the learning area. But what's happened with cloud is that you know, running SaaS applications in the cloud uh, has become kind of second nature. Putting content in the cloud is also one of the things that we see. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and then also, you know, the idea of app stores and ecosystems. And again, MOOCs are an example of that. We'll talk about that as well. Uh, and, in, you know, if anything, you know, the, one of the reasons that it's important to get on board with mobile when it comes to learning is that the whole mobile landscape has been going through uh, multiple revolutions over the last 10 years. And today, you know, the question is for many of you is how many mobile devices do you carry? Do you carry, you know, a PC? Uh, do you carry a smartphone? Do you carry a tablet? We see some people carrying two phones and a tablet and a PC. So generally when I'm out on the road and doing some public speaking, uh, a lot of the people that attend some of those events have um, three or four devices. So, you know, the question is can I, you know, in, in some cases I don't want to open up my laptop. Uh, I'm on a plane and I want to take a course. And, uh, you know, in the future we think that one of the things people are going to do is they're going to talk to a device like a smartphone that may say, hey, go get my training course. Uh, we do think the world's going predictive. Uh, when you hear big data, we think predictive, so apps are going to get smarter. So the really the thing that comes out of that is that humans and computers are going to work closer together than they ever have before. Technology is going to become a competitive weapon. Enterprises that can train better and faster, and we think via mobile learning, are going to have a competitive advantage. You know, if you look at some of the best companies in the world, they are actually publicly talking about some of the things they've been doing secretly to train their people better. In fact, Apple was in the news recently about all the courses that Steve Jobs put together before he uh, left us, and uh, you know they've been giving sneak peeks into some of the you know interesting courses uh, that they're offering. And you know, Facebook is doing that, Google is doing that, and so when you look at you know the fact that you know people are you know and talent are one of the most critical success factors in a company. Doing it well and doing it right is critical. Mobile is the new way forward. So all these trends are things that have to be looked at. We're going to take a quick snapshot of some of them. So one thing I want to leave you with, and again, we think this can happen in, uh, in learning, which is mobile is a disruptive business strategy. So it's not just about doing the learning, but actually offering apps that allow you to do more with a product or service. And so when you hear the term mobile first, you know, in banking it was the Chase Bank app from three years ago where, you know, honey, I just went to the bank and, you know, the uh, young man was sitting on the bed and, you know, he deposited the checks and was all happy. And now every banking firm in the world for consumer banking pretty much allows you to do that. So tons of things in consumer. Uh, we think healthcare is going to be really explosive. Automotive as well, where now you're seeing things like CarPlay. Uh, defense as well, but you know when we talk about horizontal areas, which includes learning and training, again, you know we're just starting to think we're going to see these new apps that are going to allow you to do a lot more, a lot faster. But when we talk about mobile as a disruptive business strategy, a lot of enterprises don't think about it that way. So our estimate is only about 25% of enterprises view mobile as a way to disrupt a competitor. When Chase came out with their banking app, it stunned the industry. It caused everybody to step back. And by the way, one of the things that's happened is not just in the consumer, but now commercial banks say, oh, yes, we have a commercial banking app, and you can do business with us from our secure mobile app. So again, it's really, really interesting about how uh, mobile is changing things. And again, when you look at speed and efficiency, um, a mobile app sometimes gives you a lot more of the speed to do things faster. And this is one of the things that the takeaway, I think, for all of us here when it comes to learning and training uh, is how could I do it better and faster if I had a mobile app? And so that's really the takeaway from this slide. If we talk about um, another 
thing that's changing is the idea of video learning or the uh, you know the famous video tutorial it's kind of crept up on us so we do cover video uh, and video content management uh, as a topic area at Aragon but you know one of the things we've seen is now it's not just uh, hi I'm Joe I run a restaurant and here's how to uh, serve a table I mean that's one of the uh, illustrative examples in the screenshot here it's also about how do I get more of my content into small snippet videos and make that part of my learning curriculum. What's happening, we think, is that the business users are doing it. We're going to talk about the business users, you know, and are they, uh, is it a good thing, you know, shadow learning? You know, there's shadow IT, but is there shadow learning going on where the business users are not waiting, they're just going and doing it? And we're going to have some, I think, ideas at the end about how you can jump ahead of that. But we think that the explosion of video, we call it pervasive video, is unstoppable. And that by 2018, video documents will replace text documents as a leading form of digital content. What's the number one form we think it's going to be? The video tutorial. And so corporate learning outside of this you know, traditional corporate communications where, hey, the CEO just did his, uh, his annual update and uh, you know, we've got that on video and they blast it out to everybody and they have a link. Corporate learning is number two. We think it goes to number one. So if you're not doing video-based learning, the question is, why aren't you? And then the second question is, can your students and can your you know, constituents, which might include extended enterprise customers, can they access it on their mobile device? And so we even see today where, oh, you know what? Not all of them, uh, or actually we're still working on that. Or yeah, the answer sometimes is yes, we can. And that's really the right answer you're looking for. So video learning uh, is a major emerging thing uh, because you know why? Everybody can create uh, videos. And you know, at Aragon, we had a couple of interns this summer. And uh, you haven't seen everything yet, but they did some amazing uh, video stuff for us uh, uh, a lot faster than I thought they could. And it was impressive. So and again, when you look at millennials, they're very comfortable with the video format. And they can edit it, they can author it, and they can tweak it. And they actually want to use it. So when you actually say, how do younger people want to work, not just in social networks, it's also with video. So you know, one of the themes that you know it's an unstoppable force is tablet computers have been around now. You guess what? It's been four years, and I remember the day that the the iPad was introduced. But it really they do represent a new way to work and learn. And you know, you have children that are very comfortable swiping, and they wonder why their TV doesn't swipe. Uh, you see uh, really mobile coming up a lot in various industries for the portable worker, the knowledge worker that has to do their job standing up. Very hard to carry a laptop around when you're a knowledge worker uh, or an information worker that has to do their job standing up. So it really has jumped into things like sales, uh, health care. You see an illustration of a construction worker. But guess what? When they're out there doing that, if they can actually take a course on that tablet, that's a very, very good thing. Instead of having to go back go to the kiosk, take their class, which is the way a lot of traditional learning has been done in, you know, um, for people that really don't sit at a desk. And so that's really one of the challenges and also the opportunities. So you know, we see a lot of movement in the K-12 space. We see certain employee populations getting you know, fleets of tablets being deployed. And again, the question that we get is, hey, we really want to make sure we're fully mobile. Uh, for this rollout. So sales enablement, customer support, uh, you know, all those sorts of things. They're looking for a full mobile way to do that. And so, you know, again, you know, while not everybody at work has a tablet, the probability that most of them have access to a tablet or, you know, in some cases a phablet, a smaller, uh, you know, smaller form factor a smartphone uh, that's in between, yeah, they usually do have access, and generally, if they could take a course securely, they would like to do that. So, what is it, you know, the big trend is, and this has really always been the issue, is, you know, if you look at the learning space, you know, you've got the way you administer, you know, the training, you know, which has generally been the LMS, and we've called that generally the TV set, and then you need the TV shows, and it's always going to say, well, where do I get my content? You know, I've got a great LMS, but I need content. And so the rise of uh, you know online courses that started in higher ed, 
uh, generally referred to as MOOCs. Uh, and generally what's happened is the online store has become really being called the MOOC, but it's really the content, which is the term where MOOC came from. Um, so universities have been offering some of their, their courses online. iTunes U is one of the biggest, you know, iTunes University is from Apple. That's the biggest online store of content for training right now. But there's a lot of nonprofits like Khan Academy. So we're seeing, and you know, lynda.com, Skillsoft, I mean, traditional ones, a lot of people have never heard of lynda.com, but that's a big online store of content. And so we're seeing more investment flowing from the VC community. We think that, again, the, it's the return of content. You know, the content market overall was very fractured, segmented. People that basically would, you know, a, a large corporation, about a third of their content they would develop internally. They would generally outsource a third of the content to be developed in a custom fashion for them. And then they would generally license a lot of content from an off-the-shelf uh, perspective. So when you look at that and say, well, where do I find the content? The content store is the big thing. So we see enterprises building content stores for training. So you say, you know, I want to search for this course, um, and I want to run on my mobile device. But it, the store uh, methodology was not really around a couple years ago. It started in mobile, and now we think enterprise app stores for learning are really one of the new ways forward. So that's one of the reasons why we think that the content market for learning globally is going to double from $300 billion in 2013 to about $600 billion in 2018. Where is the growth coming from? The growth is coming from the rise of video tutorials. And so we see uh, millions and millions of tutorials coming online. Even if you look at Khan Academy over the last three, three years, uh, they had very small uh, viewership in 2010. Now they have millions of viewers a day uh, looking at their uh, training, which is mainly you know higher ed, K to 12 stuff, you know, teaching uh, children math, or and the children can generally teach themselves once they have access to, to the tutorial. Now we only think that about 25% of all learning content goes into a store methodology by the end of next year, but again by 2018 we see that changing quite a bit. So and guess what? One of the requirements is it needs to be mobile. So the store makes it easy for people to find the content, to either buy it or log in and access it. And again, we see money flowing into that. And so the question becomes is, how are my employees accessing content? Do we have a store mechanism? And to be honest with you, it's not that hard to go and get one of those. And again, learning in the business buyer. So this is the shadow learning thing that I was mentioning. Uh, the business leaders, they want their people to learn faster. And you know, when I was uh, on uh, the vendor side, and uh, I was doing a big rollout years ago when I was at Xerox. You know, uh, in some cases, I did some of the product rollout without going through learning and development. Um, so the challenge, as we'll talk later, is for learning and development, working with IT and the business leaders to make sure that the business leaders are getting their stuff that they need to do. They need product launches. They need tutorials for support. Uh, and again, training for sales. Not everybody knows how to do a video tutorial, by the way. The learning professionals generally do. But again, sometimes people aren't waiting because they want to go faster. So again, this is the idea of speed and agility. Uh, there's an unlimited demand for learning content. And the challenge is how does the L&D department move faster to support um, these uh, you know, very challenged business leaders that just have to do more and they have to do it quicker. Let's talk a little bit about some of the technologies. So again, we have a, a piece of research that we update annually that's called the Aragon Research Technology Arc. We evaluate technologies, uh, whether they're emerging, adopting, or mature. In this particular case, what we said is, what are the ones that are actually helping businesses do more and do it faster? We took a lot of legacy technologies, like, for example, enterprise content management that's in the workplace technology arc. We said, you know what, that's good, but it's not necessarily helping them move faster. But we did leave corporate learning, which is not a new term or approach, right? Learning has been around for years. As long as the companies have been around, they've had people that basically either they were an understudy, you know, now you have the fully fledged corporate learning department. And why would we have that as saying that's helping people drive their business faster? That was the theme of this technology arc. Well, guess what? The ones that are doing it right are. They're moving faster. And so that when you look at you know, some of the fastest growing companies in the world, and again, over the last seven years, Apple has doubled in its size. They're bigger than Microsoft. They're twice as big. They've finally divulged that they spend a lot of time and money training their people. But when you look at mobile, for example, look, enterprise app stores, we highlighted that as a, an area that's uh, growing. 
It's in the adoption phase, almost midway through. Mobile content management, mobile application management, right above MAM, you have social HCM. So there's a lot of things that are kind of coming to the fore. Uh, you know, we see huge demands for people from enterprises that want to do more with mobile. I didn't highlight video content management. Again, that's also one of the areas that has moved pretty fast. But and again, the, the thing that's kind of interesting is we call it the resurgence of learning. That's what we started calling it last year. And in many cases, we see it you know, growing even faster. Now, the challenge is that we're at the spending, and the spending is mixed. It's across the enterprise rather than isolated. And again, sometimes it's hard to track that. But that's one of the things we've seen because we're, we're talking to a lot of business leaders, and they are investing in their people. There's no doubt about that. When you actually look at our learning architecture, and again, you look at some of the traditional stacks relative to learning, the learning applications, you know, particularly the LMS, uh, we, we see from a mobile perspective, and again, the content part of it's on the right-hand side, is we see mobile app enablement, meaning that, you know, and again, when we look at providers like Expertus, you know, what are they doing and what are the others doing with a mobile app? And again, a lot of people have mobile apps. The question is, what can you do with it? Obviously, experts will be talking about that in a little bit. Uh, but that's the big thing that we see is that people want to be able to do stuff with their mobile app. And so the question is, what can you do? And as we talk a little bit later, there's a, you know, in fact, we're going to talk in the next slide. It's not about having an app. It's about what can you do with it? And again, that's where we start seeing is it's not just a browser replacement. It's doing more. So, in fact, as a matter of fact, when we actually talk about that, we, this idea of mobile first and simplifying the business process, um, and we've been talking about this for several years, which is, you know, a mobile app is not a really big piece of code, but, you know, because it's not a lot of real estate, you don't have that many screens. And so, and again, you know, some of the things, you know, we've called them over time, we used to call them micro apps, uh, but the idea is it's task specific, it's very easy to use. Uh, it doesn't take that long to develop it, uh, the app, and it does things on a very, you know, you're updating it regularly. So, for example, you know, the mobile device doesn't really care what it does, and, you know, we've got some examples, but, you know, the big thing we see coming is, you know, it's not just a replacement for the browser. And so when you're actually out there looking at uh, products and services, what does the mobile app do? And by the way, people are becoming very finicky. If they don't like the app, they click off and they never use the app again. So, you know, when we've worked with people on this thing, we, you know, relative to them developing their own mobile apps, and we'll talk about this again um, over the next few slides, uh, it's about simplifying that business process. Can you do everything you need to do in eight screens or less? Because generally, a good mobile app isn't going to have that many screens. Um, and, uh, you know, why? For example, mobile first, can you do more with a mobile app than you can do with a browser app? Because on a mobile device, we, and we've called this the app personality matrix, you, there's more things that the device can do. It can tell you, for example, you know, where the training room is. Are you close to the training room? Because a lot of times when people are going to a new campus, they don't know where the training room is. So the mobile app sometimes can say, yeah, you're pretty close. Uh, you know, and uh, can it deliver really, really smooth video, uh, you know, as far as uh, video delivery and part of a course? Yes, it can, because it's got built-in codecs that can recognize, oh, that's a video stream, I need to play that. And it plays it smoothly, nicely, easily, where you don't get a DLL error because the Windows operating system needed to be updated. So that's another thing when you start calling some of these things, is particularly imaging and content and rich content, both audio and video. Again, the mobile device is just designed to do all that. So that's why you know so many people on planes like to watch movies, because the tablet was designed to do that. And, and the same sort of thing for learning, where we've actually called the tablet the ultimate learning device, because it really is built for rich media. And the question becomes then, at the app level, is what are those things we want the app to do? And uh, again, for, for the, in the learning space, obviously delivering content is a big thing, but also making, you know, and you know, the question is, can I do it online or offline? Uh, so we think, you know, again, when you look at mobile first, we're going further than a traditional browser-based app, that's really one of the concepts that we're trying to, uh, to talk about. We think the explosion on the enterprise side, you know, by 2016, there's going to be over, uh, you know, huge numbers of mobile apps. And, you know, the smaller percentage is going to be on the enterprise side. But even in the last 12 months, the enterprise growth has been just amazing. 
So now I'm going to turn it over to Caleb uh, to hear more about what's going on at Expertus. So if you bear with me. Excellent, Jim. Uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, the insights so far. Uh, here you go. We'll get, we'll get this taken care of for you. There you go. Excellent. So based on what Jim's been going through so far, talking about uh, how mobile technology is coming in, especially on the learning side, what our plan was to take you through uh, a couple of pieces of how Expertus, uh, with the Expertus One learning management system, is pushing the boundaries with learning with uh, the mobile learning side. Uh, for those that don't know, just real quick, um, ex who Expertus is, we've been in this business for about 15 years, uh, doing learning technology, bringing innovation to the market. Um, as part of that, the last five years, we've really spent all of our time and effort focusing on Expertus One, which is our enterprise learning management system. Uh, so Expertus, we are a global company. We have offices across the US, Europe, and India as well. As you can see here, we've been recognized by a few of our analyst friends uh, for the different innovation, new technology, um, different success we've had with customers in the marketplace. Uh, as part of that, you know, thinking about Expertus One, mobile is absolutely a major part of uh, the learning experience today. And when we started building Expertus One several years ago, looking at it from a newer technology perspective, we wanted to make sure that mobile was natively built in, that it really wasn't an afterthought or just an add-on piece. So as part of that, again, Expertus One is a core LMS. It's going to have all the instructor-led tracking event management pieces, all the e-learning video components that you might expect. In addition to that, we also made sure that we built in a lot of the newer trendy items, uh, different modules, things like social uh, learning, covering collaboration, knowledge sharing, uh, things like gamification, e-commerce. Uh, there's even a video conferencing platform built in and a customer reporting engine. So for those that uh, are using outside systems today, you can definitely solve a lot of that with a native SaaS tool built into Expertus One. Being newer technology, though, part of what we tried to do at the core was publish all of our APIs. So we use that, those APIs. There's just over 100 of them today that we give customers access to to really leverage the platform, build on top, take advantage of um, you know, new workflows that might be outside of the learning management system. We use those same APIs, though, to enable mobile. And as we go through, and I'll show you the mobile app here in a few minutes on what we're doing, that using those APIs really lets us uh, build one platform duplicate much of the functionality inside of the mobile experience, but then also leverage mobile uh, for the, some of the newer technology pieces and additional workflows. And then we use those same APIs to build things like some of our standard integration modules that we have with Salesforce and talent modules. Uh, and lastly, on um, this, just kind of wrapping up the big picture on Expertus One, you know, everything in the system today is really profile based. So as you think about how data is getting out to people at the point of least resistance, uh, Expertus One looks at who that person is and says, okay, based on what we know about you, here's the catalog of training that you should have. Here's what we recommend. Here's what's mandatory for you. So kind of going back to what Jim was hinting at with the, the prescriptive pieces of on this big data, especially on the extended enterprise side, we start thinking about training partners and customers and you know, disrupting the marketplace. That profile data really comes into play, especially on the mobile piece as well. So I'll come over here and talk about mobile first for just a second, kind of the, the philosophy of this. The approach that we've taken with mobile um, with Expertus One is really to say as we build in new functionality, new features, new modules, look at it holistically and say, okay, how can we enable uh, mobile in these different aspects? So instead of just building a, um, you know, a module for instructors, for example, where they can go in and manage a roster. How can we take advantage of some of these pieces within the different devices that people are using? You know, a lot of times instructors are in front of a classroom. They're not actually sitting in front of a desktop. So can they manage some of that classroom via the mobile app? So we tried to look at the technology piece of it uh, first to say, can we take advantage and leverage some of the technology that's in the different devices out there to expand, enhance, improve the experience outside of the standard learning management system on the browser? And you know, Jim, Jim was definitely talking about the video portion of this as well, we see a large shift in our customer base as people are developing new content, making content for mobile, going down the video snippet path. Three, five, seven minute videos. Uh, video works really, really well, uh, from a, especially from a phone standpoint, but even getting into the tablets. And then also leveraging 
what people do mostly on their phone, which is managing email, managing your calendars. So instead of saying, okay, you have to go in and always be taking actions, looking at how can we seamlessly connect the learning management system on the mobile side so that maybe people's calendars are synced. They don't actually have to go in and accept invitations when they sign up for classes. Very simple concept. In addition to that, we've looked at, again, that idea of le uh, the point of least resistance for people getting to their training and getting to the data, pushing that out, saying, okay, people are they're on planes, they're traveling, they don't always have great bandwidth where they're sitting. How can we give them access to training still? Take advantage of the, out, the devices they already have out in the field. So instead of going in and reinvesting in certain um, hardware, you can take advantage of you know, phones, tablets that are there, let people take things offline down. In addition, you bring out things like analytics to where a lot of times managers aren't sitting in front of a desktop as well. They need to have access to data uh, when they're interacting with people. And so giving them the ability to set reminders, see graphs, have analytical portions of their training data right in front of them. So on my last slide here, and we'll jump into the app, in taking that larger view, mobile first concept, we've drilled that down to really, at the end of the day, you have these different roles that people use to interact with the learning management system and providing them access. Learners can go in, they have the full experience right inside of the app, they can take training, they can download, they can register, they can see progress. Instructors have the ability to manage classrooms, they can actually close out rosters, they can push surveys. And then on the manager supervisor side, We've tried to push the data and make it available to them to where they can go in and you know, approve and reject chain training. They can see the progress of a team. Uh, they can do some reporting concepts directly from the mobile side. So let me go ahead and pull this up for you. And we'll walk through the, uh, the app here briefly. And we'll give it back to Jim here in just a few minutes and finish up some of the presentation. So what you're seeing here is uh, Expertus One Mobile. This is uh, using, again, the REST APIs to connect directly into the primary platform in the cloud, all real-time data. Uh, this app is available in iTunes, Google Play, so it supports all of your uh, current devices. As a learner, I can go in and I can see my learning. This is the exact same training list that I would see if I logged into Expertus One on the web. I can download training. I can watch videos. I can see the details of classes that are being taught. And if I have things that are maybe mandatory or recommended for me, I can do that from here as well. In addition to that, and this is actually one of the more popular features we've seen in the app, is the catalog. A lot of times people aren't necessarily trying to take training in a mobile fashion, but they're trying to take care of the tasks when they have five minutes before a meeting. Or maybe they're in transition. So I can go in here, I can view the catalog, I can sign up for training, I can see if there's a class that I need to go through. And it's intuitive enough, again, it's pulling real-time data, it knows I'm already registered in things. So it's not going to try and take me down some you know, a, a dead-end workflow that's going to kick me back out. And I can filter these things down. I can find other training. So again, it's, it's a complete experience. It's not a point solution, which is one of the concepts we've tried to come back to, is that people don't necessarily want to just do a video on an app or just do one action. They want the complete experience, just like you would expect to have if you're using Twitter, using Facebook. It's a multi-device concept. Uh, we've also brought in a lot of the social aspects Things like, I can go in and see what's highly rated, what's popular. Switching over, think about it from an instructor standpoint, one of the items I can do also is manage my class. And this actually starts to take advantage of one of our unique features, which is called presence sensing. So as you can see here, I have a class that I'm teaching, accounting for managers that's coming up in October. I can actually go in, I can see the roster, and I can see who's yet to arrive. And as I click this, here's the, the group of people. Now, if the users, if the learners that are in my class actually have the Expertus One app, when they walk in the classroom, it actually uses GPS, recognizes who the person is, and it moves them automatically from yet to arrive to arrive participants, and it notifies the instructor. So the, the whole idea is I'm now taking this idea of having to manage in a roster, something very traditional people have been doing for many, many decades. I can complete it, com convert it completely to being electronically managed, automation applied to it, because we're taking advantage of some of that technology that's inside of the app. Going forward, you look at uh, some of the other roles here that are built into the app as well. You have, again, talking about from a manager perspective, things like analytics. 
where I can go in and maybe I need to see the progress of my team today, right? So I can actually say, okay, there's a class that I know, um, let me come back here. There's a class I know that's coming up. I need to make sure all my sales team has completed before our big sales meeting, right? So let's go ahead and search for this. And here's my academy training class. Everyone has to finish it, for example, before they can come to the big meeting. So we'll click on this. And let's go and see the class summary. So I'm going to switch over to my manager view. And so for my team today, I've got, uh, let's see, six people that have completed this, two that are incomplete, and two that no-showed for the class recently. So now I could go in and drill down to see who are these people. And so I can see that Edward and Jordy didn't show up for the class. I clicked on the no-show group. Right here from the app, kind of a, a closed-in workflow, if you will, I can say meet all. And it's going to pull up my email, and I can send them a message directly from the app saying, hey, go do the class already, right? The idea is manager, managers don't have to go in, run a ro uh, roster report, get some to talk to a training administrator to get the details. I can do it all right here from the app, take an action given the data that I've been provided, which is a huge advantage. We see this as a major uh, time saver for people that are especially there in the field. Now I'm going to come back to the app and show you a couple more things where we're starting to leverage more of the technology that's available. Uh, we're coming to the settings piece. One of the nice things with Expertus One is it is a localized platform. We have a lot of global customers that are using it. In this case, the app is actually localized as well. I can go in, change my language settings, and I have the app in my preferred language. In addition to that, I can also sync my calendar, as I was mentioning previously. Simple concept, but I know all of us have gotten meeting invites for different classes we signed up for. But if I turn on the syncing for this, I can actually go in and link it to my personal calendar or my work calendar on my device. I don't have to go through and do a, a larger integration to connect this to Outlook or an Exchange server. I can do it right from here. That way, every time I sign up for a class, the class is closed out, deleted, then I can actually get an automatic update. And it will even do things like conflict check against my personal calendar, make sure that I can actually attend the class. So in, in wrapping up on the, the app portion of this, the concepts that we've tried to apply taking a mobile-first approach, as well as uh, trying to leverage the different technology that we have out there today that are in these different devices, is to say, how can we take uh, something that people are doing on a browser today and really make it available to them, again, at that point of least resistance? Everyone has a device they're walking around with on a regular basis. I can give this to them. They can go through, take training on demand, as well as I can manage my business from this app. So. Uh, thank, thanks for uh, taking a look at this real quick, and I'll hand things back to you, Jim, and we can keep going. Great. Excellent job. So that was a great example of, uh, uh, you know, how Expertus is, is going mobile first. So let's continue. I'm going to put uh, go back into uh, show mode and so the, the last two issues I'm going to talk about, the uh, how can you deal with legacy content? And there were some tweets, actually. So while Caleb was giving the demo, I was actually monitoring um, what was going on in the tweet chat. So we're going to talk about legacy content, talk about some best practices, and then we're going to do Q&A. So this is one of the things. And again, there's a de there is a great debate. And there's not necessarily a right answer, but I'm going to give you uh, our opinion. So responsive design. So this is, in some cases, a bridge, how you can actually get to uh, get content to be more, um, to be workable on a mobile device. When I say responsive design, for those of you that aren't familiar with, the, with web content or something called HTML, which is web pages, you can actually make uh, you know, a piece of content um, actually appear on a web page in a browser or to miniaturize it so when it comes up in a smaller form factor, you can actually see it. You don't have to resize. So when you go to a website and it actually, the whole website appears on your smartphone, that means that that website is responsive. If you only see part of it or if it's cut off, then that website is not responsive. And for learning, obviously for learning content, this is one of the migration strategies. But here's what we would say. That's fine. But what we are hearing that the users want is they'd rather just have an app they could click on and so that they, and that could serve them up the content. Obviously, it's going to be responsive. But you know, it's not that responsive design is bad because it is one of the ways you can deal with, uh, with 
you know, getting content moved. But in many cases, our opinion is, you can sometimes, if you start to learn how to do the mobile app piece, you can move faster. And the reason I say that is having, you know, it's, 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 you know, you just have to understand that there are different tools out there, and some of them are becoming very visual, meaning that, you know, as a user, a non-programmer, I can actually drag and drop not only storyboard, but actually then design the app. So that's what this screenshot is actually trying to show, which is the idea that mobile first is about not doing the same sorts of things. So again, you know, um, if you're doing responsive design, that's good, meaning that you can get your content so that it works on a mobile device. But think about the idea of, well, how can I make the course better? How can I blow away what they actually are going to learn? So for example, one of the things we've seen recently is you know, uh, quizzes. So instead of having to go in and take a course and then take a test, uh, you got product knowledge. Uh, you know, we've seen some people that are saying, you know what, we're delivering you know, and we're competing sales reps against each other by just delivering some quizzes to them. Uh, interesting, interesting approach done via native mobile app. Um, but again, that's the idea of mobile first. So again, you know, uh, and again, we still see a lot of firms uh, that maybe aren't ready for native apps and they want to do responsive design. And again, I'm going to touch on this a little bit more. So what about this? So how do you deal with legacy content? Our suggestion is you inventory your courses. And again, sometimes that's one of the things, you know, when you actually are evaluating courseware providers that have off-the-shelf content, how fresh is the course, you know? Um, and that's really one of the questions that you start looking at is inventory your courses. What are the ones that are mission critical? What are the courses that are used the most? You know, for example, if you're hiring a lot of people, you probably have a number of onboarding courses. Hmm, interesting. Maybe those are candidates to be moved. If I've got a piece of content, for example, relative to selling skills, wow, I probably want to mobilize that. Uh, but what about the stuff that's not used? So that's when you start doing the inventory. This is a high-level view, you know, looking at the stuff that's, and I, and I called it old and tired, but also unused. You know, those are the ones that you say, okay, we're just not going to touch them right now, and we're going to start dealing with the stuff that's used first. And again, this is a technique that's actually used in migrating uh, content libraries in general, uh, because in many cases, there's an awful lot of content that's out there. In some cases, it's just not being accessed, so is it going to be missed? So this is one of the ways, when, because one of the things we've seen and we've gotten feedback from a lot of L&D departments is, we just don't know what to do. It's all flash-based. We can't get it moved, and it's frustrating. And in some cases, it's because of some of the courses, the way they were designed, the tools that were used, and also the fact that you know they don't have a refresh strategy. That's really one of the biggest things. But let's just say that you've inventoried your courses and you do an assessment, you start looking at tools, and then the redesign, storyboarding is critical, prototyping, and, and then going. And so one of the things in the, in the middle of this, and I'll go a step further in a second, storyboarding, prototyping, the prototyping thing is, is what we see is starting to change a lot. And so you know, mobile authoring, or it's also referred to as mobile app development platforms, MADP, um, they're coming online becoming much more visual. So it's not like a, a business person mocks up what they want and then they have to turn it over to a programmer. You can actually do a lot of visual design. Um, but you know, in any type of learning content, storyboarding is so critical. The same as it is in doing a video tutorial. But the thing that we would say is you would be surprised how quickly you can get to a working prototype. And then you know, after you've tested, you launch and go, and then you do regular updates where people fall apart in regular content today, learning content, and with mobile content is the last thing, which is not really highlighted, regular updates. And I can't stress enough, if there's one thing we leave you with, if you're going to go mobile and you're going to have a mobile app, uh, either yourself or your provider has to be updating it regularly. What's the cadence of up, uh, updates that people are expecting? Well, you know, it used to be you know, a couple years ago, uh, every six months, and then it was every quarter. And now you're seeing um, leading providers updating it every two to three weeks, some cases every week. Uh, bug fixes mainly. But again, the idea of the continuous process. And this is where budgeting comes into play. If you are an L&D leader and you have a content budget or you are working with your business units, you need to get the business units to budget for regular updates to content. That's the biggest takeaway I'm going to give you because it basically means your shows, the TV shows, the learning courses are getting old and stale. 
and yeah, you know, you have to spend money keeping them fresh. Uh, a deeper dive relative to this, you know, which gets into the whole development phase. So you say, you know what, we want to do a mobile app that's going to basically allow us to access all of our content or the content that's mobilized. How do we do that? And again, this kind of gets to uh, some of the processes that you go through in a software development lifecycle, uh, SDLC. But again, updating regularly. So again, I've said it twice, but that's really, really critical. The thing that's interesting, though, is people say, oh, that's really hard to do. Uh, we're not going to do that because it's hard to do. Guess what? It's a lot easier because a mobile app doesn't have that many screens. That's why we used to call it a micro app. Mobile apps are not big. They're not big development efforts. Syncing them, integrating them, you just saw, again, a great demo from Expertus. Uh, so we would encourage you, when you look at the whole approach, if you're doing responsive now, it's great. Think about, how could I do uh, a mobile app? And then some best practices. Again, there's a lot of ways to leverage content. You know, in, in, in your curriculum, there's a lot of different types of learning courses. Uh, a lot of times, you know, what we've been talking about today is like the basic course. We've also talked about the video tutorial. We see, again, the video tutorial having high demand. But again, when you look at your courseware libraries, uh, again, you know, the basic course, uh, you know, some of the older simulations or newer ones, uh, making sure that the tools you're going to use to develop them going forward are fully support. Uh, mobile enablement, and, and then the other thing is, you know, being able to call those, you know, if you're going to have an overriding app, or being able to deploy those in a mobile app store. Uh, but again, mobile enablement, it must be a design criteria, and it's kind of like becoming a way of life. Um, and, you know, it's not new, but what's happening is, is that some organizations are moving faster, and, you know, they're speeding the knowledge acquisition, the knowledge delivery, which is really what training and learning is all about. They're speeding the delivery of that through mobile. And again, when you look at your app strategy and learning, there are ways to classify apps. You know, in some cases, a basic overview, which could be for customers, um, which might be, you know, again, constitution, you know, about our company. Um, you know, you can do a lot of learning uh, through a basic app ca kind of capability. The transformational ones, and again, that's where you get the looking at the maturity of uh, the different apps. Uh, redefining the business process is really what the disruptive part of it is. But, and again, some of the basic services, like accessing the service, I want to access my learning service. I want to have an app to do that. I want it to be branded with my company. And again, those are some of the things that we're spending time talking with people about. But again, having a strategy, not just saying we're going to go mobile, but having a full strategy to do that uh, across your different learning properties in your enterprise is important to step back do some planning and 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 do that. So, again, we we live mobile every day, and we think again, you know, companies that do mobile learning are going to move faster. And partnering with the business. So this is one of the things from the earlier part of the thing, which is what's the business demand? How is L and D responding to that? Are you partnering? Are you offering all the different types of courses? Are you showing flexibility? Because guess what, the shadow business approach, which is, I'm doing my own learning, I'm not using the LMS. Uh, I hear that a lot more than I used to because people are frustrated and they're not afraid to go and sign up for a SaaS service or go get somebody to develop a mobile app for them. And by the way, that's the other thing. People, the business people are saying, yeah, I just had, a, I just signed somebody, they're going to develop a mobile app for me for my product launch. So they're going out hiring somebody to do a mobile app, which by the way, you know what the big thing they're doing for the product launch? They're doing training. So getting out in front of that and showing them how you're, you know, current and staying with that if you're an L&D is, is really important because they're not afraid, these, these younger managers that have grown up with mobile, they're saying, yeah, I just, you know, did it. In fact, you know, um, I'll just say this, you know, one of our interns challenged me saying, you know what, we're just going to mobile app, we're going to do a mobile app, I'm going to develop for you. So again, you might be surprised what people are willing and able to do because they're just not afraid. And again, moving to mobile first, so we've published research about mobility, and again, there's, you know, there's a lot of things in mobility, but app development, when you talk about mobile first, and, you know, having a mobile strategy, and again, you know, it's not just about, you know, having something where it replicates your browser, but actually real mobile apps, and again, mobile, the mobile enterprise, uh, we think mobile learning is one of the key aspects. So when you look at your maturity, where you are in mobile, these are some of the phases we look at. And again, sometimes what happens is they say, well, we're doing a mobile app for a business, but they haven't thought about learning. Don't let them not, like, pass go. Say, hey, learning's got to be mobilized too. 
uh, we need to invest in that and uh, make sure that you know in L and D that your people are getting trained and they're up to speed on some of the latest uh, tricks of the trade. Uh, because you know what I would say is there's certainly a lot of consulting firms that are going to pitch HTML5 all day long and may not be ready to help you with the with the mobile app. So again, mobile's the new normal. Uh, learning content needs to be mobilized. Look for learning providers who can help you with delivering on the mobile learning story. And our biggest takeaway is don't wait, because it, the sooner you get started, the higher the probability of your successes. And with that. We're going to start with some Q&A. So, Caleb, I don't know how many questions have been coming in while I've been talking, but let's go ahead and open it up. Yeah, we have a, a couple of questions that have come through, Jim. And if anyone else has anything here, kind of last minute, that you'd like to post up uh, for Jim to touch on, please go ahead and do that. So, one of the, going back to one of your earlier uh, slides or earlier topics, Jim, one of the questions that came through was around, you know, what tools, software, are people you seeing people use out there to convert for mobile-ready learning, whether it's video or it's e-learning. Um, so any recommendations or common tools that you see being used? Uh, you know, here's the thing. We, we, we haven't seen uh, the, the, the big issue with the tools is there's so many of them. And so, you know, that's, I guess, one of the things I would say is uh, certainly when you talk about just regular app development, there's a lot of tools that are popular. Some of them have been open source. Uh, there are other commercial tools that allow you to cross do cross-development. Um, you know, for example, I don't know if people have heard of Kony, but you know, clearly that's one of them. Uh, clearly, you know, on the um, running the mobile program, you know, like you know, you just saw the uh, Expertus One mobile app. Uh, a lot of the uh, learning providers are all they all have mobile apps, but you know, the content part of it is the harder thing. So, you know, um, sometimes the debate is are the you know app tools that allow you to write uh, a course and then deploy it across iOS, Android, and Windows. Uh, they're going to give you the speed and efficiency. So some of them, um, you know, if it's just a basic course, actually will do a pretty good job. Uh, or if you say, you know, we're going to do a video simulation in this mobile app, then sometimes you say, you know what, well, I'm just not going to get that driver. It's not calling it fast enough. I'm going to do it in natives. So there is there are design considerations after you've storyboarded the course. Well, it's a performance you have to look at and the tools that you select. Uh, the thing I would say to you, though, is uh, there's, there is a plethora and I think there is going to be a separation of church and state coming because we do see newer visual design tools coming online over the over the course of this fall. And uh, you know, in fact, you know, Apple's thrown down some gauntlets relative to some of the iOS design capabilities that they put out with their new uh, programming language. So, and by the way, that's free. You can go sign up to be an Apple developer and get access to their tools for free. That's that's perfect. And just kind of an extension on that, um, that that question, Jim. We had another one that came in as you were talking there. That was just asking about the top mobile development platforms. And I know you were hinting at this a little bit, but I think you'd mentioned one earlier in the presentation. And if you know it off the top of your head, we can reference it. Otherwise, we'll yeah. So up. I mean, there's there's some that have been open source that have been are still popular. PhoneGap is a popular development tool. Adobe okay. owns them now. There's a firm called Accelerator. Um, uh, Accelerator Titanium. Uh, they also are open source, so some of them you can still get some free access to a basic capability. Then they want you to pay for the the better license, or the, some of them allow you to do one. Um, and then uh, one of the firms that's uh, really been doing some high end. You know, if you see a lot of the apps for car companies and some of the high end apps for like actually controlling your car. Some of them are using a tool called Kony to develop those kind of apps. So okay. a little bit more expensive, but does a little bit more too, because in some cases it can, you know, control the accelerometer. You know, the app can actually control the accelerometer or the gyroscope that's wow. on the mobile device. No, that's great. Thank you. And you know, we get, we have uh, I think two more questions here. I know we're getting kind of the end of our time, but just wanted to make sure that uh, we touched on these real quick. So one of them was kind of switching topics, going on the gaming theme here, but. In your opinion, if, as you've seen gaming over the last couple of years coming more into the learning uh, piece, and have you seen it be successful? Is it a good motivational tool? Are you know are people continuing to use it? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the thing here's the thing we would say is the difference between a game and a simulation is very small. And so when you actually talk about you know heavy duty skills training uh, simulations, which can be you know, somewhat gamified. Um, that's really one of the classic ways people learn because the old apprentice program was basically, you, you, you know, carpenters learned from experienced carpenters and so did bricklayers. Um, 
you know, today, you know, police learn to chase people in cars through a police simulator, and pilots learn to fly in simulators. So, in selling, you know, simulations are one of the most popular way to learn because you, you're doing repetition, and the brain is learning uh, the soft skills through repetition. So, we do see that. Now, here's what that would say: is we think there should be more because you can do it a lot less cheaply. So, again, the thing I would say is when you hear gaming, think simulation. I mean, that's a training term, but uh, there's a lot of tools out there to allow you to do some great simulations, and a lot of them are mobile today. Perfect. Uh, and actually, Jim, I think you touched on, on all the questions there. So uh, if we missed any questions at the end, we'll definitely make sure to send, uh, send out uh, a digest of things, and we appreciate your time. So, Jim, I think that you covered all the topics. Great. Well, look, thanks very much, uh, Caleb. It was great uh, spending time with you on the webinar. And uh, Gordon, if there's anything for a wrap-up, I want to thank everybody for joining. And I think uh, there's uh, ways uh, to contact us, but, uh, you know, aragonresearch.com, uh, expertus.com. So, again, thanks very much.